Runners, here we are for a bit of, uh, we're at the Emerald, lovely sunny day in Melbourne, yeah, a bit cool, but not bad. Uh, yeah. Springs, uh, yeah, sun's out, blue sky. Yeah. And uh, I'm joined by the punters punter. Hello Pots, good to see you. And our special you, guest, Bruce Wheeler. Which, uh, Hello Bruce. Hello mate. Ex jockey, or ex jockey. Ex. Uh, recently retired, we thought we'd get him on the show. We thought a bit of a uh, highlight, uh, we said on the last show we might highlight um, a bit about jockeys and their part in the industry. Pots, we're more about the front, but jockeys are an integral part of that. And Bruce has been a, a close mate of mine for a long time, so. I thought we'd get him on the show and um... Well of course DK, after the horses, the next most important uh, factor in form assessment is the jockey. Absolutely. And it's the one with, um, well it's got as much variance in it as anything else because they're all capable of riding really good races and poor races. The better jockeys just make fewer mistakes. Mm. That's, that's the way I look at it anyway. So. Be good to get some insight from Reese about uh, yeah. not only his own career but about you know um, what, what what the punter should look for in, in different Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll do that. But I thought we we just yeah, well, he's on. We'll have, have a reflection on his career. A lot of people know Reese when he rode, and um, Reese he retired in 2016, I think, about two or three yeah. years ago. Yeah, had about 6,000 odd rides for 600 winners so over 16 years. Had your first ride in... Uh, that was two... just in Australia. Yeah, in Australia, that's right. Yeah, you, you rode... That's all I could get, mate. But I know you rode in Macau. 10%? That's pretty... That's all right. That's straight true. Uh, first ride in 2000. Yeah. And you won. You had your first win a week later. Maui on a horse called Toy Halo. Remember Jimmy that? Jimmy Conlon, yeah. Jimmy Conlon. Oh, Jimmy Conlon, yeah. It's all right. Bit shitting, did it? Or just hang on for dear life? No, no, it won quite easy. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, that's all right. Nice to get off the mark so quick. Um, now, Reese was champion apprentice in 2002, 2003. And I'll just read out the field of jockeys that that he was in. So D. Oliver won the Premiership. Second was Karen McAvoy. Third was B. Preble. Fourth was Gauchy. Fifth was G. Childs. Sixth was Nash Willer. Seventh was Reese on 33 wins. S. Arnold was eighth. Our old mate A. Finlay was ninth. Who was a very talented rider. Some people might remember A. Finlay. And tenth was Mark Zara, who was the other apprentice on 31 wins. So Reese knocked over... Uh, it was probably one other. Reese McLeod would have just been outside. Just outside, was he? And he, was, and he, was, and he was, it was between the three of us. Was and it? there was, like, the list of apprentices that year was very, very strong anyway. Yeah. But I think Reese got away to, a, like, a flying start. She, you know, theory had probably 20 odd winners before, halfway through the year, and then he had a couple of incidents. He broke his wrist and uh, uh, things yeah. happened. And, Wheeler got home with a wet sail, did you? Well, was, yeah, got very lucky. Mark broke his wrist actually with the last week to go. Oh, yeah. And uh, good old Bush Padre saluted in the last two meetings for me and got me the title. Oh, Bush Padre, I remember him, Bush Padre. Yeah, what was the difference in wins between you and Mark Zara? Oh, two. Only a couple. couple 33 to 31. I think I, I, think I nailed him uh, like when he rode the we. I think I drew even with him on the last meeting, uh, last Saturday Metropolitan meeting, which he rode at. And then there was only one or two meetings left. And, Push by drive. Yeah. Push by drive. You, should have, you should have had me as your manager. What I would have said to you back then, I would have said, look, do a deal with Zara and split your lifetime's earnings with each other as an insurance policy. <laughs> I didn't mention his lifetime earnings at the time. It was about $10 million, I agree. So it was about over 16 million. Prize money. Prize money. A little something for that for Reese. Yeah. Um, you had a few cracks of group ones, mate. The closest you got was a second. Uh, a couple of seconds. A couple of seconds. A couple of seconds. Oh, that was one you had overseas. Oh, one no, in Australia. Yeah, a couple in Australia. Who was the one in Australia? Bush by drive. Was it? No, so, no, I'm trying to think. Was, no. it, was it an Oakley plate or something too? Was I reckon. Um, reactive, you won a group three on Reactive. Yeah. And a Tristark Stakes, and she went on to win an Oakley plate. Yeah, couldn't make the weight. Couldn't you? Couldn't make the weight. Mm. She got up and saluted quite easily, actually. I know one day. So, so yeah. what, when you're an apprentice, what weight were you riding at? Um, I attempted <laughs> to ride 49 a lot. <laughs> Um, so you were down yeah. around 50 and, and I rode generally 50, 51 a lot. And by and the time you finished? The weights kept rising. Yeah. Oh. I finished. Oh. He had to kill himself to ride 54, didn't he? No, <laughs> I struggled to ride 58. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, in the end, um, like... Uh, I can't laugh, I'm he... sitting here at 120, so <laughs> oh. I'm too jockey. <laughs> I got off a good ride in Adelaide before the... Um, oh, through Peter Morgan, he had I'm Invincible. I did a fair bit of work on him and he had 54 kilos in the lead up to the Goodwood. Said, oh, you can ride him, and we were, I think it was three days to go, I was still 59, and, had, and I said, oh, I got no way. So, well, one day, I, and, you know, he was, and it was one of the fastest horses I rode, yeah. and I've gone, well, I couldn't get the weight off to ride in, it just never came in. Well, one day you did make the weight, mate, it was in the uh, 2003 yeah. Melbourne Cup, yeah. in your only Melbourne Cup ride, you. You rode old mate, old mate Bold Bard for uh, Stanaway, oh, Mr. Stanaway, who was the sandwich man. Um, Maccabi Diva's first Melbourne Cup. Um, I watched the replay this morning, he actually gave it a peach. He gave it every possible chance for a 300 to 1 chance. <laughs> Just parked, that was you know, un, that was three or four lengths off the speed and uh, gave it a peach. What are your memories of that day, mate? I know the weight killed you that day, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It, it really did. But in saying that, like, the, once uh, 
I know, I've ridden Melbourne Cup there a lot. You ride in that sprint race after Melbourne Cup, you see uh, yeah, there's a little bit of commotion afterwards and everyone's up and about, obviously. But to actually ride in it was uh, was different again, different level. And even just going out of the race, like it was a bit, it's a bit surreal, you know. It's a real sunny day. You probably didn't want to be there at that point. But when you got behind the gates, it was and it became all business. It was just uh, being able to look back up the straight and you'd see all their heads. Yeah. Unbelievable how it just was just choppers. Yeah. So what what barrier did you draw roughly? No, you drew six, six or seven. Six, six, or so you're, you're inside. You're in the gates at the top of the straight there, like at the top of the yep. four hundred meter shoot. When they jump, as a jockey, when you you, you say you switched off at the right, how much of the crowd can you hear? No, nah, the first bit you can hear it. Yeah, the, you right generally there. hear for the first two hundred, the first two to four hundred meters because they're still yelling. Yeah, you can hear it, and then when they hit the winning post again, yeah, it's again. like a second little uh, little roar. So then you go right around the back. Yep, you come to the home end of the home straight, and it's on for young and old. You don't hear a thing. Don't hear a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it's a, a in one ear out the other yeah. end. You're too busy uh, thinking, yeah. Head down, bum up, then you're not worried about what's going on. You sort of can actually, when you just hit the line, you sort of just pick up the microphone and yeah. the on course uh, broadcast. But that's just like fleeting. It's your last little. Just effort. watching it was great. When you watch, I just watched the replay this morning. But particularly the start, you know, 20 more horses across the track in that start. Greg Miles, the noise and everything, and. and you know, it is, it's 20 horses coming down the straight in the Melbourne Cup for the first time. You, there's a lot of um, sorts rough. of men from the board. It can yeah. be pretty rough, but Reese, Reese probably just, uh, so you kicked up, you held your spot, just nice, 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 and then you just ended up in that three, four links off the lead, one out in a perfect spot. You gave him, he was actually gave a great ride right. for Bryce. He's actually one of those uh, trainers who, he's at least ridden and he's been there, he knows what, and his partner, well, she was an ex jockey as well. So to ride from in the race like that was very easy. The confident, uh, it was just go out and enjoy it. No, uh, no instructions. Go do what you want. See, uh, see where you end up. We get lucky. We get lucky. And he actually, that's how I wanted to use this for races on him. Why that way? Just go out there. So in the run, I'm just trying to remember. I'm shimming. McCarthy David was behind. Back, just back inside him. Back inside him. But one, one or two pairs yeah. back. The U came wide on the turn, and Mossy just sucked up. So he went underneath yeah. you. Underneath. Yeah. Nah, it was old Grey Grey Song come up underneath me, and he they just left me for dead. Grey Song. And I thought I actually thought I was going okay on the top of the straight. And old Grace Song just put three four on me, and then she just went straight past him like he was now the fence. She accelerated like it. Yeah. Hopefully played it. But the way he he figured it, like Grace Song and uh, it was all. Uh, well, she's Archie, and they yeah. come flying after her late with um, Fantastic or something like that. Yeah, maybe. that's it, Fantastic. Yeah. Like they come flying late, but yeah. the first one to go was the Grey. You could see him; he just left me for dead. Yeah. But then you see her; she just picked him up, and, like he was now the fence. So. Well, what are you doing? One of your three highlights, mate. Even though it was a nice 16. Well, <laughs> we've got nothing out of it. Yeah. That's over. That's over performing. Now, I've got a yeah. trivia question for you, Potts. Okay. And it's a good one for out there for you know trivia nights at clubs and things like that. Uh, who was the rider who rode the Great Flash to tackle to his first ever win? Well, it's got to be. It's got to be. Wouldn't be Dwayne Dunn. No, he got beaten at Pinfold in Seymour Cup Day. Yeah. By thinking of Nicky Birch. I can remember him on a, about third or fourth run at. Um, once at Hawkesbury and once at Skane, he, he got back the last boat. I mean, once he won, once he completely slaughtered it. He had, he had a few slaughters on Jatak. <laughs> I suppose that's a <laughs> sort of Skane Guineas. Yeah. So, yeah. He got it. He slaughtered it. Anyway, I mean, he does that sort of horse. But I'm, I'm guessing, DK, it's got to be Reese Wheeler. It was Reese Wheeler, mate. Well, how about that? On a great place. You get one of, the, one of our greatest horses. And uh, so D Dunn got beat on at first start. Uh, D went at D Holland, there was a day, a famous day at um, Clayton okay. Cup Day, the next start. The, the inside was complete quicksand, as bad it's ever been. So all these favourites, it was a dollar twenty-five today, and it found the quicksand and got beat. So they put in the paddock, brought him back at Geelong in March for his uh, autumn campaign, and uh, we were aboard. And that was a nice little steer racing straight to the front. And Wayne actually got dirty because I hit him. <laughs> so you led all the way on your tackle. Well, yeah, you led all the way. You're, you're probably the only jockey that's ever led on your tackle. Oh, I reckon he led his first two at starts. I reckon. His first two but you got him home. So yeah, 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 but he, uh, yeah, he left it for the top of the straight. That didn't, I, it went dead silent, actually, right him. Uh, yeah, you're watching him power through the line. Yeah. Oh, Reese gave him that. Wayne, Wayne's dirty on him, he gave him a hit. But Reese just said, what have we got here? And <laughs> made so, a little feel of him. Very quirky horse. They yes. got more quirky as he got older. Oh, no, no. He was, he so was what was he like as a young horse? Unique. Yeah. Is the best word. He was very, very quirky. He had his own way. I reckon I went through Flemington quicker than I ever one day galloping through the middle of the track than I ever did up around the track. Right. He was just... Uh, just took off. Yeah, he just had a mind of his own. Yeah. One day he wanted to do something, that's what he'd do. But he was always very, very quirky. I think I was lucky to get on him uh, through the trials. And he nearly went... Uh, he used to go under. He nearly went underneath the barriers a couple of times with me before he got to the races. It's, 
Uh, he was very, very temperamental. Yeah. Yet his sister, London Lollies, was the quietest filly and most bomb-proof animal you'll ever see. Yet he just had a he just had a mind of his own and yeah. did his own thing when he wanted to do it. Yeah. And he still he'll still do it today, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, he was. But he was a great rider actually. Uh, when you got to gallop him, and he actually you were allowed to let loose. So I think that was the only time I was allowed to quicken up on him. <laughs> when, still when, I trolled, I, yeah. when I trolled him all the time, I was never allowed to let him go, never allowed to move on him. I just had to get him well, random. Obviously, he was pretty good. Yeah, you just had to get around in one piece. So do you remember that day going yeah. around to the gates? Yeah. Did you go around with the clerk? With the pony? Or? No. No? I didn't. I said to Wayne, I should get the pony for this, because this could end up back <laughs> at Flemington. And he goes, hey, you'll be right. Just get on and get around. It's, uh, one, it's one of my, I like, I really, I mean, it's, you understand why with particularly quirky horses like and young horses, why trainers have to get them around the gates with the with the, a more experienced horse until they, until you can get them to a certain point. But as he got older, they, they kept with it. And I think it made him more and more lazy on the way to the gates. And that's why he was, that's my theory yeah. on why he was dropping out of the races early. He actually never had a pony at home because he was never really trustworthy to go right. near another horse. He didn't really know what he was going to do. So I think it was, uh, I think, it might have been when Dwayne won the Bobby Lewis yep. on him. I think they used the pony that day to get him up the straight because they didn't know what he was going to do and how he was going to react that day. And, right. and from there, it's just stuck. Yeah. Now, another horse, Reese, who was very, very close to my heart. I'll tell a story about him in a minute. It was uh, the people's horse, as we called him, Star Rolling. What a good horse he was for us, mate. Eh? He was a little ripper. Run two in a row at Flemington for you. And, um, well, I'll, I'll tell a story to start. So, I see Peter, Peter, Peter Morgan. Peter Morgan. So, I've known Peter Morgan since I was a kid. Yeah. And he was he was my trainer. He rode another horse, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and that's how I met Reese. So, anyway, so I just just finished at Sportsbet. Just finished. And I'm out of my own in the first couple of weeks. Not sure what I'm going to do, but decided I was going to bet on maidens. Started watching some videos. And I, because Peter was my trainer at the time, I paid particular attention to his horses. And, you know, I stood, started rolling. I've seen it. It's trial, all right. Went to Seymour. And M Gap rode it, was out the back, and over in a 1200 metre race or something. And just got home late, but got beaten eight, nine lengths, but I just, like, like did something. something. Did something. Yeah. So then Wodonga's on in two weeks' time. So it's Wodonga 1400 or Mile Maiden or whatever it is. Mile Maiden. So um, I'm doing the form, and Pete Star Rollins in that race with Blinkers first line. So that was interesting. And the favourite was Robbie, Robbie Lang favourite. Robbie Lang. D. Gauchy, called Tristram Sun. And the uh, so first thing you either do with Robbie Lane favourite is find an alternative or back up the truck. You know, that's what we do. So anyway, so I've done it for I said, I can start rolling and can win this. You know, I'm going to take this on. So I rang Pete Morgan. I said, Peter, he was at, where are you? He said, I want to go in sales. I said, well, this star rolling today. Yeah, what about it? I said, you can win. He said, oh, can it? I said, yeah. He said, well, you, you ring Wheeler. You go and tell him what to do. <laughs> so I've heard it. So I'm ring, ring Reese. He's on the way to a dong in the phone. Yes, mate, what's doing? I said, this star rolling thing, yeah. I said, he can win this, can it? Good. All right, what do we do? I said, we'll just keep Gauchi in your sights. Just stick with Gauchi, and um, he's the favourite. It's the only other hope. You'll beat the rest. So I watched the replay this morning. He's a good replay to watch, Reese. So <laughs> Reese, he was about very annoying. It was a bit awkward. So I thought Gauchi would leave, which he normally did. But Gauchi took the sit in the 1-1. So Reese is there with him. So Reese is sitting three wide outside him. And so he drew nine. What, what gate did he oh, get inside? He, he, he drew in, but he, he took the one one. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but Reese is travelling up outside him anyway. So Gauchi at the four or five hundred at um, at Wodonga pulled the trigger and yeah. on the it was a dollar ninety. Yeah. Travel to the lead. Reese outside him, just yeah. towing. Star rolling after being three wide, the trip just towed and just gave it wind burn in the straight, just charged the line ten to one, and it, that really got me going. I made a good bet on it. It was my first sort of bet on my own as my own as a punter, and. Um, he went straight to Flemington and won two in a row, didn't he, yeah. Reese? Geez, he was a good horse. He just coincided at the right time for me, too, because uh, Mum and Dad had a horse, Dick and Skate, come through at the same time. Yeah, and they were both, right. both three year olds in the back end of the season. They just, I think, uh, I think I rode eight winners in town between the two or three horses. Uh, you rode a the double, time. they won the same yeah, day, didn't they? It was a big that, day for you. Yeah, that, he, geez, he was a good horse. He was just stiff that um, even when he won in Adelaide, he was, they were trying to get him ready for the Corfield Cup. But he couldn't get into the naturalism, yeah. so he missed the race. He did. Adelaide. It just, it just all went he just, though, didn't and it? then he had to go to the Metropolitan, and then something happened again before the Metropolitan. So everything he tried to do just didn't work for him. And he ended up going around in the, I think he went around the Cranbourne Cup. Cranbourne Cup, you drew the outside. Yeah, he slipped coming out of the gates. His favourite that day. He went in behind, and, and he was just never the same after yeah, that. Really. Even yeah. at the top of the straight that day, he was actually he was going to blow him away, and uh, I just saw the tight turning track, and I just got the better of him. He just didn't find the line like he did, but. 
he actually pulled up pretty ordinary that day and he raced like that consistently after that. He was never really let down ever again like he did at Flemington in them days. So great story. What piques my interest ever is you're on the way to Wodonga, the phone rings. So how well did you know Dan at that stage? No, I've known Dan for a long time. At that stage you don't like, he'd ridden no, my horse I've, nine wives, which is yeah, different to yeah. do nine wives. No, many, many years by that stage. So so yeah, yeah, we were close by then, I was doing the, helping doing yeah. the form, and I'd speak to him most days on the way to the races. He'd ring me or I'd ring him, saying, yeah, right, right. how are we going to... So it was a regular thing. It was a regular yeah. thing. See what the tracks were going, he, uh, and it was good. Dan had a good insight in most of the tracks in yeah. the country at that time, which was, you know, you had half a dozen rides in some of these bush meetings, you couldn't yeah. keep it. You can keep an eye on them with uh, somebody inside doing all the work for you, which made it a lot easier for me. Uh, good stuff. So, so, but typically, when you're on the way to the races, when you're, when you're doing a fair bit of riding, you might have yep. three, four, five, six rides on a day. How hot's the phone ringing on the way to the train? Uh, no, but not generally, not really. It'd be uh, usually a couple of trainers, uh, manager a few times, yep. vice versa, and it'd be, yeah, very minimal. When you're riding every day, it just it becomes mundane for a lot of people to keep ringing you. Yeah, yeah. So it's too hard for people to keep ringing you. Yeah. And the only time, like I said, maybe, uh, I reckon uh, when he won in town, I reckon I had more phone calls uh, after Star Rolling and She Can Scope one, one in town, that double. I had more phone calls that night than I had before all year. Yeah, so right. it generally just doesn't ring. Yeah. And if people want to get off, they speak to your manager first. Yeah. They go, oh, can we speak to you? You're usually too busy to talk, so they, they kind of left me alone, which is good. Now that's good, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's a lot of... Um, the way names are a bit different. Yeah, a lot of rumour and a lot of, you know, people think things are happening. Yeah. And, and the, the reality is nowhere near... It, like, you've got to get the conspiracy theories and divide them by about... You know, maybe 10. Yeah, well, yeah. Might be 50, so yeah. like, you know, but... Um, no, most, most of the jocks are real professional these days. Most of them have got people who either do the form yeah. themselves, they help them with form, yeah. like they help Reese. Um, Especially on the way the race, you don't yeah. want to can't ring at the start of the trip. You got to you go to a chew gun. There's no point bringing in somebody uh, when I've got a two-hour drive to go. You bring them in the last half an hour. Go, okay, what what have we got today? We've got half a dozen rides. What's the pattern? Yeah. So how do you reckon he's going to play out? How do you reckon this is going to happen? And and you just work it back from there. But yeah, it's too hard to have yeah. the phone ring in the whole two hours. Yeah. I wouldn't answer it anyway. Just logically, there's just not enough time. No to get involved with too much scuttlebutt. I mean, when they're riding trials and jump outs and work and now, riding at five, six meetings a week. You've got a day and a night meeting now yeah, to go. Well, there, so. Jumping in the sauna, driving to the races, it's just, it's tough for you, know, we what Bruce gave it away, it's a tough gig, especially if you're not getting on the good cattle. Yeah. You know? So just as an example of some of my frustrations, but it's just a, it's a frustration at the situation that jockeys are in. It's yeah. not their fault. It's, it's the industry that's got to help them more. The worst thing. So I, on Saturday, so I, I went out to Flemington on Thursday and spent an hour and a half walking the, the track and I spent like a good 45 minutes walking right up the whole straight course. And it was, well I'm sure, it's my opinion, so it might, it's not, it's, it's a subjective opinion. And subjectively, I thought the inside half of the course was one to two lengths better than the outside half of the course, unless you got outside where the, jump outs were three weeks ago where they dug the course up a bit, which is where Sutori got to. Now I would say, yeah. reviewing it in the end, it probably raced better the outside half than I expected. However, not one horse got to the inside half of the course in the three straight races on Saturday, and I reckon any of them that had it would have found an advantage of one to two lengths. But didn't uh, the yeah. Robbie Griffiths horse try to go back to the inside in the thing? Didn't really quite line him, sort of. Was that the deal, yeah? yeah. No, 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 the green colours, sorry. Not the mud bags. No, that's 1400. We'll talk about that. The horse that got closest, closest to the inside in the straight races was Parsifal. Parsifal, yeah. He ran second. He ran uh, He probably got to maybe one gone, horse inside yeah. the middle. When it's gone like an Egypt, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's, it was outside that ground, so it might have had an advantage. So there was like five or six lanes out there that were pretty chopped up from a set of jumping. Anyway, I digress. My point is that. You know, I might be frustrated with that, but the, when, when do the jockeys get time to do what I did? They don't have, they don't, there's just no opportunity for them to do that. The other thing on that side is everyone's getting told a different, different thing. thing. Yeah. So you've got a jockey going in there where the owner's saying this, the racing manager might say this, the trainer's saying this, and the form student might be saying this. So you're getting four different ideas, and in the end you're getting the gates going. Funny like that, Linda <coughs> said, I told Phil, for different points, I just go and do my own thing and yeah. see how we go. And Linda said she loves that, she loves no instructions. She said about Satori, Matt and Simon just leave it up to me. 
Yeah. And that's how I like it. Yeah. I just just do their own thing, you know? John Hawks was very much like that. Yeah. If you stuff it up, it's your fault. If you get it right, you deserve the praise too. One more, one more story. No, one more story. Alright, one, one more story. Got a good story. So this is before. <laughs> this is this involves our wheeler, but before I met him, of course, it's my first trip to Macau. So Reese is riding in Macau. Um, this is about 2004, 2005. Reese, your yeah, first trip yeah, to Macau. Yeah, yeah, right. And I had other mates over there. They were doing jockey manager stuff. You know, Chris Parry was there. Yep. Roscoe, Rusty Smith, stuff like that. So there. So I was over there to visit to visit visit uh, Roscoe. So I go to. I'd never. Been to Asian, no idea about Asian racing. I've been to Hong Kong and Singapore once. My first night out of, um, of Asian racing was Macau. That night got there, let's go to the races Friday night. So, what are we doing? We're in, we're in Joe Lau's box. Roscoe said, Joe Lau's our man, he's the leading, one of the leading trainers there. He's, uh, he's a man. So, we go in this box, beautiful, it's all laid on there. And in the in the corner of him, there's these professional form guys, a couple of guys from New Zealand and things like that. Got laptops. I said, gee, this is all right. Um, they're doing form for Joe. Um, when the race on, Joe would come up, speak to them, what's going on. Joe was a big punter. And this and that, and Russell Cameron was in there. He was on the balcony of the other trainer, he was training at the time. He says, Geez, we don't win, if, we, if we don't win tonight, if I don't win here, I'm never going to win in the races. So this, is, this is all, I love this Asian racing thing, right? So, a few tips early in the night. What do we go to the boys here? What are the numbers? And when I was got to have a queue, then can't fire anyway. So, what's but, the betting involved there? All tight, they okay? All tight, all tight, yep. and a volatile tight. But all tight, yep. all tight, but it was a volatile tight. Only truth was only known after the race to get yep. in, sort of thing. So, Anyway, so three or four races in, doing no good, losing. Anyway, Joe has a runner in, in the next race. So I followed the paddock parade was just down below the box. So I wandered down and uh, watching them parade. And see Joe there, and he's talking to his rider, uh, Wheeler. And it just, I was just, I was just looking intently because the horse looked really well. And it was like in that Let It Ride movie where Joe sort of whispered to Reese, go fast and win, something like that. <laughs> What? Out of the front and okay. your position. Hello. So I'm going to barrel back up the stairs to the box, grab Roscoe and the boys, and I said, Yeah, what are the numbers here? What are we doing here? And they said, No, eight, nine, seven. I said, Well, this Joe's horse is number two. So I said, Roscoe, number two here, Joe's horse, we're in his box, but still, no, 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 no tip. So, okay, all right, so, all right, then I must be wrong, must have, must have read it wrong. So go and put on the beds, Quinnell, all fucking bullshit. Anyway, so I watch him, so anyway, Joe comes in the box, I watch the race, pulls up a chair, I'm standing there, he's sitting there. So I thought, I'm watching the race go around. And Reese was in blue colours. And um, what was the thing called? Uh, I can't remember his name, well, but I know the horse. Yeah, uh, anyway. I know that I remember it. Well, Bel anyway, Belleville or something, Belleville Rock or something like that. Anyway, so at the 200, but Reese put it in the 1 1, pulled out at the 300, got to the leaders, and Joe bounced out of the chair. Home you go, Belleville! <laughs> Home you go! Home you go! Jumped up, everyone's he's roaring, high for you, beauty, charged out of the box, and shits him. 40 to 1. Oh, no. The room, the rest of the room is silent. I'm looking at these blokes. I'm looking at Roscoe going, fucking out in the balcony <laughs> now. Quick, just tell me what the hell's going on here. I said, what's happened, mate? What's happened? I said, yeah, that Joe's kept that one for himself. Joe, no one, no one knew that. That was it. The ducks and drakes, everything like that. And he said, with the 40 to 1, he said, the SP, you bet SP bookie, there's SP yeah. bookies for yeah. those blokes there. Maximum pay at 10 to 1. Right. Because the tote's so volatile. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think he hasn't filled up at 40s, he's filled up at 10s. Yeah. But they had no idea that Joe was back in that horse. He just kept it solely to himself, the whole thing to himself. And uh, home it went. That was my introduction to Asian Race. I think he keeps yeah. asking me what were the instructions. <laughs> what, what did he tell you? What did he tell you? What did he tell you? I want to know. Right, it's like, like, a, right, like it's a good thing because yeah, it, it is. That was uh, it. Let's go forward and stay out of trouble. I, I, went out, I was out in the balcony. Russell Cameron was there from Valet. And um, another sad, sad, sad death this week. You would have known Russ well, well, Bruce. It's a sad, but um, he was deteriorating, you know, mm -hmm. with his Alzheimer's. And he, anyway, he's on the balcony, and um, he didn't look that happy. And I said, yeah, "Yes, Russ, Dan Kelly, uh, nice to meet you from Australia. What's going on?" He said, "Oh no, he said struggle on here." I said, "What happened?" He said, oh, "I said you wouldn't believe it. Last week, had a horse ready to go, set it up for three months. Um, you know, needed a winner. We're in the mounting yard before the race, about to leg the rider on." A uh, big owner comes over and says, uh, yes, Mr. Russell, uh, not today, Mr. Russell, not today. We're backing Mr. Potts' horse over there. And Russell says, you're kidding. This is, this is just jumping out of its skin, this horse. So he said to the jock, don't get time on this, but, you know, this is the, you know, but there are something happening over here. So anyway, it wins, it won, and the big owner took 18 horses out of his stable wow. on the Tuesday. So it was a tough, tough group, but 
a bit of fun though to join yeah, Michael. Oh, it was great then too. I was so competitive then. Like, uh, there was, I think it was like 1,400 horses, and um, we had a good crew of Australian riders there at the Beast time. Beast Stanley so. was the leading rider. Yeah, Noel Callow was Callow there. Callow was there. Didham was there. Brad had just been there. Yeah, there was a heat. There was a heat. Well, what a crew that is. Oh, uh, Beast Stanley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even Vinnie Coughlin from New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, so. And there's a good. It's a good lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, I helped Joe. You run twice a week and you just. I'm, I don't think we're home for any day in between. Yeah, yeah, it's good fun. We end up DDs, the big, the great disco. So we go this night after the races, let's go to DDs. Where are we going? We go to destroy DDs. It's grouse, you know. So I go down there, I said, What's going on? He said, Oh, Roscoe, just, just said, Hold on. And then he said, We're up here in this private area, right? What do we do for a drink? He said, Just hold on. He said, Horace is looking after it. So it was Horace, Horace Lamb, Horace Lamb. And one of another leading riders, one of the leading local riders there. The next minute, these little waiter guys bring out these bathtubs, one on each end, full of ice and beers and black Russians and everything in there. It was all laid on by Horace. He must have had a good result or something that night. It's all laid on. So I go to the, I go to the um, later on the night before a drink. I go, I go to the toilet. There's a commotion. So I get in there, and Joe Lau, the trainer, the Filipino bouncers are laying into him. So I just, I just made a run. I said, "Get off him! Get off him! Get off him!" And he's cast and things like that. So I got him out, got him up the stairs and put him in a cab and just went back to business. And then the next day Roscoe said to me, he said, oh, what happened last night with Joe Lau? I said, I helped him out of the helped him out of a bit of trouble in the thing. I don't know why, I don't know bounces. I'm not a big scary guy, but they let him go and got him out. He, so he said, oh, okay. barbecue at Joe's on his roof at his yeah, penthouse right. joint this afternoon. Joe wants to thank you. Oh. So we got there and with the boys and all these all that hunting crew and everything, all having beers up there and and then apparently Joe stuffed a couple of grand in boy's hands and said make sure you take Dan out and make sure he has a good time. Thank you for looking after me. As you know, Macau, it's not a bad, with those instructions, yeah. Bruce, it's not a bad, <laughs> not a bad choice. Very, very easy to have a good night. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, anyway, that's a, that's a good night. Surprised they beat up, tried to uh, lay into poor Joe. Like, yeah, he must have. He they, must have, have tipped on the wrong horse or something. <laughs> they refused to go near Vinnie Coughlin and he was half his size. Right. So. Uh, anyway, so there we go, mate. Great yeah. stories. Well, that, that first story you told, told DK about the, uh, the 40s, Horse that the trainer like. Oh, yeah. It's an early lesson in, in listening to your own instinct, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there was, absolutely. It was amazing on the market so, change. I think Warren Huntley said on yeah. TV yesterday, he said, a good judge once told him there's a very, very good chance your opinion is right. Yeah. You know, your first opinion, whatever it is, that you're right. Even though the market's drifting and all this stuff's happening, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. It reminds me of that uh, punter that Mark Lamb will talk about, that everything that he backs, he marks some five for two on. <laughs> I'm right here, and yeah, that's right. how I'm going to be. <laughs> that'll, right. do, that'll do us for part one. We'll be back shortly, with, and we'll talk a bit about Flemington and everything else. Cheers, punters.